scientist. The bite is the blood of a thousand men and women was filled in these laws. Limbs twisted and broken. Eyes gouged from bloody sockets. Fresh burned black. You're listening to the OmniSound Radio 1 Network. Hey guys, we're back. Welcome to World of the Unexplained. I'm Jay Scott. I'm Trent Lackey. I've got my new catchphrase now. What's the catchphrase? The only JD DJ on the OmniSound Radio 1 Network. That's really cheesy, Scott. <laughs> I mean, it's as cheesy as my line. Uh, well, yeah. uh, we're in beautiful North Carolina, Kernersville, North Carolina. It's been fine, fine weather. It's oh. actually really nice today. Yeah. Welcome, nice. It's good welcome beer drinking. Our listeners. We've already got a caller. Come on, man. Wow. We haven't even started that. Okay. Uh, wow. All we'll right. go ahead and put them on hold anyway. Okay. So anyway, tonight we've got on the show, we've got a, we've got Oliver Williams talking about John Teeter, the time traveler. You can pronounce it Teeter, Titer. We were actually... However you want to pronounce it, we, I we've think been talking about it. Proper... Well, Teeter seems to be the way everyone's going with it. So, uh... Anyway, um, the caller, I'm, I'm just going to have to, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to I'm gonna I'm gonna drop this caller here, the, the one that just called in. I know you can hear me. Um, um, Oliver, sorry. we're going to keep you on because we don't really want any questions until we even introduce you. But he runs the JohnTeeter.com website, and uh, it's it's up. You can you can see it there, uh, www.JohnTeeter, T-I-T-O-R. Yeah, T-I-T-O-R, that's right. And he's compiled the information about this man that claims to be a time traveler. So without... Um. Without further, further ado, ado, I guess we'll we'll bring him on. Oliver, how are you? I'm doing fine, guys. How are you doing? We're doing hey, great. Oliver. Can you hear us okay? I can. I can hear you just fine. Okay, Excellent. awesome. It's a little low, but it's not bad. Okay, okay. I, I, I think I can fix that. How, how's that? Um, that should be fine. Okay, okay excellent. Hmm. Well, give us an introduction, yeah. uh, Oliver, about what you do, how you came to do it, and uh, what it's all about. Absolutely. Um, John Teeter is a man claiming to be a time traveler who first showed up on the internet in public in November of 2000. And he answered questions on various forums, he talked about who he was, he posted pictures, and then he abruptly left in March of 2001. Um, the reason why it sort of caught on was that he said various things which a lot of people are pointing to as being predictions, and some of these things, according to people, have come true. I first found out about this in 2002 when a buddy of mine told me about the site or told me about the post. So I went looking for him and I discovered that the posts were all over the place on different forums uh -huh. and they had a lot of clutter between people asking questions and talking about other things. So the first thing I did was I took all of his posts and I pulled out everything that wasn't specifically about what he was talking about and then I created the John Teeter site. Um, since then, when I first put that up, we started getting flooded with email, and we started getting zillions of hits, and I realized I sort of had a tiger by the tail. Oh. So that's when we started posting news and some other things. That's when the book came out. Um, that's when somebody did a play, somebody did a ballet. Now there's a movie being made about hmm. it. So we, we try to collect all that on our site, and we try to answer as much email as we can. Well, wow. Okay. So uh, you, you've basically taken all the information floating in various sources, and you've compiled them into one place. True. Now, keep, keep in mind also that a huge mythology has grown up around this. So there's lots of other information out there. But what I've tried to do is concentrate on his posts. I've tried to put in my site exactly what he said, and then I left a lot of the other stuff off. Okay. Uh, now, now I was as we were talking before we came on the show, there's an attorney that is supposedly, his name's Larry Haber, he's out of Florida, in the Orlando area, if I'm not mistaken, and he claims to be representing the family of the little John Teeter now, who's supposedly around eight years old. Is that correct? That's correct, and, you know, I'll give you a little backstory on that. According to John, when he got here, one of the first things he did was he contacted his family, you know, his mother and his father, 
and he spent that time that he was here with them. And John tells us he was born in 1998. Now, when he showed up, he said he was 38 years old. So that meant if he had stayed with his family, he was interacting with his young self. Well, after John left and went back to the future, apparently, of course, his family was still here with the younger version of himself, and they were the ones that supposedly have now gotten an attorney to represent them. And I guess Larry handles the book and some other things that are out there. All the um, all the intellectual property issues. Yeah. But uh, interestingly enough, you know, Larry is a real person. He is He's really an entertainment attorney. And, uh, you know, so it's that, that part of the story is not false, that he is really an attorney. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I did check him out, actually. <laughs> but uh, it, it's just amazing, I, you know, uh, to, to hear him speak. Of it. It, it, you know, it reminds me of the term, the whole Terminator thing, you know, where you go back and you see yourself and kind of it, it, it's really it's really odd. Yeah, there's a lot of interesting issues involving that. You know, you see yourself, so do you influence yourself? Yeah, does that affect be, the time continuum? Yeah. Does that, how does that affect I mean, that's a really you know, heavy, what's going to happen? Anything involving time travel is pretty heavy. Now, I, I know that, that John made a lot of predictions, and John said that he may be on a different, maybe a different time stream, I guess. I, I, don't, I don't even know what it's referred to as, but a different time continuum, I guess, than the current one that we're on. So what may happen, what he saw that happened in his life may not be exactly what this time stream is going to, what's going to happen exactly like that. Is that, is that right? Yeah, I could give you my best shot is at how he explained it and how I think most people understand what he said. Okay. Um, John described time travel as, well, first of all, he, he said that there's a theory right now in physics, which is called the multiple world theory. And according to that theory in physics, um, there are an infinite number of universes where there are an infinite number of things going on in them. So everything that could happen or will happen is happening right now somewhere in one of these alternate universes. And at the time John said that, of course, that was purely a theory. Nobody really took it seriously. But now if you start to research alternate universes, you'll find that there are some major physics behind that. And in fact, now they're spending a great deal of money to actually prove that that's true. So that was an interesting development in the last six years. Hmm. What John said was that the way that you quote unquote traveled in time was that he described it as standing in a room with mirrors on each wall, sort of like when you're in the barber shop. So yeah. you look left and you look right, you see infinite reflections of yourself standing in that mirror. Yeah. And what he said was actually happening was that you were sort of stepping through the wall into the room that was next to you. But each room was subtly different. In fact, he said that the, the mere fact that he was here made our universe different from his past. So what that meant was is that a time traveler could go to any point in time and he could screw up history. And it would not affect where he was or where he started from because that would have been a completely separate universe. Yeah. Now, can okay. he get back to the one that he left from, the same one? Yeah, actually, he said that was impossible, that he could never get back to the exact universe that he started from. Mm -hmm. And he described it as something called divergence, which <laughs> meant every universe that you go to is going to be subtly different no matter where you go or start or end up. But he said that his mission would be completed if he could get back to a universe that was close enough to the one that he left that they would still be expecting him, mm -hmm. if okay. that makes any sense. Yeah, yeah, yeah. somewhat. Now, what... Okay, I know everyone's going to wonder why he came back, and I know it had something to do with an IBM computer, an older computer. Can Correct. You, can you tell us why Why did John Teeter come back to the past? According to John, he was part of a military unit, and his mission was to go back to the year 1975 and interact with his grandfather, who apparently was instrumental in working on one of IBM's first personal computers. Okay. And his mission was to get one of these computers and then bring it back to 2036 where he left. And according to John, the reason they needed this computer was because it had some sort of special coding or it had something special about it that nobody knew about except IBM, which allowed them to connect to larger mainframe computers and repair them in the future. Um, you know, and of course, at first, everybody thought this was ridiculous, but two interesting things happened after John left. One... An engineer from IBM came forward um, a couple of years after John left, and he said that that's absolutely true, that not only was he telling the truth, but he was one of the guys that worked on that function, and there was probably only 100 people that knew about that, and nobody ever talked about it after it happened. 
And the other thing that happened was NASA came out with a new story, and they said that they ended up having to go to eBay to find old parts for their systems because nobody made them anymore. Huh. So it's not a ridiculous notion that if that were their need in 2036, they might have to send somebody back to get something like that. Huh. Okay. Now, do you... What is, what is your connection? I know a lot of people probably assume, and they would assume wrongly, I'm assuming, that you have any connection to John Teeter or John Teeter's family because you run this website. I don't. Again, I'm just a big fan. Um, I, I can't say I was the first to put a website up about John Teeter, but I started getting all this email, and we started collecting news stories, and we just kind of got the ball rolling. And then, of course, um, we got various requests for people that wanted to talk about the story, and that's how it all got started for me. And there's pictures on your on your site of the time travel vehicle and some of the other stuff, some documents. Correct. Okay, and they can they can view that at, at www.johnteeter.com. That's T-I-T-O-R, and uh, you can check out these photographs. You can see the book. I think there's a link to even buy the book there on the site or a link to Amazon. Uh, correct. Actually, you know that's not unusual too. There are if you go to lots of John Teeter sites, they link to the book also. So again. That's not my book. It's just I'm trying to collect everything together in one spot. Understandable. Okay. Totally understandable. If um, you wanna, if you wanna call in, uh, we had a caller right as soon as we started, and we're sorry we we dropped you just for a second. But um, the two numbers that you can reach us to talk Go ahead. about John Teeter and so on and so forth. The the first one is one eight hundred nine six zero two two eight nine. 1-800-960-2289 and uh, if you have a cell phone or local, you live in the North Carolina area, uh, the number is 336-996-1596 Both of these are on our website at worldtheunexplained.com okay. You can also jump in the chat room with us here, just go to worldtheunexplained.com, click on chat and you'll be brought into uh, Flash Chat, make up a name and join us tonight, the chat room's filling up pretty good right now, we're in the WOTU room, so uh, World of the Unexplained WOTU, <laughs> anyway <laughs> All right, um, so let's get back to this. Now, the the idea of, of the time travel machine, this is built upon an idea in physics, and, and let me tell you what, I don't know anything about math. I don't know anything about hard science. That's why I went to law school after college, because I, <laughs> I don't understand any of it. Uh, but, but I know that I, what I do understand is it's some kind of theory of using black holes or small black holes to, to travel through time. Uh, correct. And again, you know, I'm no expert in physics either. Um, and we just sort of followed the news stories. But in fact, this was the first um, event that made me pay attention to this. When John was talking about how his time machine worked, he said it operated with two, he called them micro singularities, which in effect are mini black holes. Uh -huh. He said that CERN would discover these and that they would start producing them soon. And he even gave a date that this first announcement would be made, and it was September of 2001. And that's exactly what happened in September, which is what brought my attention to this. CERN did indeed come out and announce they expected to be able to do this. Uh -huh. um, according to John, these two micro singularities are held somehow in the machine, and they're bombarded with electrons, they're spun, their gravity is affected, and that's what allows them to control gravity, which, which allows for time travel. Okay. So by using this, this gravitational, or these gravitational anomalies, I guess, that allows them to... to to do this. Yeah, you know, I, I also want to add that even though that sounds very ridiculous in science fiction, um, there's, there has been some powerful math behind this, and apparently John was asked some questions from a couple of physicists while he was here, and he was able to answer their questions. So to my knowledge, you know, I know there's been some physicists that have come out and said this is all baloney, but there have been others that have come out now and not knowing about John's story, they have come out and said some of the same same things about this that John said when he was here talking about it. Huh. Now, when did John when did John quit posting? Um, John said he was leaving and he quit posting in March of 2001. Okay, so roughly um, five years ago. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, you know what? Since you brought that up, here's something else. In fact, this happened today. Okay. Um, and this is on our site too. We just updated it. John made mention of another machine called the Z machine, which is a, a, some sort of a particle accelerator or something that they have out in the Sandia National Labs in New Mexico. Okay. And he said that 
Um, twice he mentioned this facility and saying that they would soon discover an energy source, that they would be um, instrumental in the development of this machine. And today they announced that they are getting very unusual readings from their machine that they cannot account for, and that they're getting very high energy and temperature levels, which they believe now could work, could, uh, could get toward a working fusion reactor. Wow. So that news story came out today, and it's on our site. And if you look up Z-Machine on Google and plug in John Teeter, you will see that he was talking about that six years ago. Huh. Mm -hmm. Now, how many, how many of these things, I guess what we should do is we should go back and look at some of these predictions that he's made that have come true and, and some of those that, he, that he's made that haven't. And uh, what, what would be probably some of the bigger ones that have happened, as he said? Oh, I've got a little list here. Um, one of the most interesting ones, and again, this is part of the mythology that's not on my site, but a lot of people believe this. It's believed that John sent a fax to Art Bell in 1998, <laughs> which is the year that his mother claims he first showed up in our time. And okay. in this letter to Art Bell, which Art read on the air, John claims to have made mention to the destruction of uh, the... the uh, World Trade Center in New York, well wow. before it happened. Um, okay. Of course, he also talked about the black holes at CERN. He said that Mad Cow was going to come to the U.S. and it was going to be a major problem. He talked about the IBM 5100, and that turned out to be true. He said that China was going to be the next country to put a man in space. He said that there would be no weapons of mass destruction found in Iraq. <laughs> he said that Hawking was going to reverse his stance on radiation, which of course came true. He said that the U.S. Constitution was going to be slowly torn away from us over the next few years. Which is slowly coming true. <laughs> which is coming true. He made multiple references to space shuttle problems. He talked about cancer being used, I'm sorry, as virus cells being used to um, aid in the cure of cancer. He talked about a woman president by 2009. He talked about the Internet changing and going to a node system that would be wireless. And he made reference to hydrogen and uh, hydrogen being converted to propane, which would uh, which would replace the internal combustion engine. So, those are all things he specifically talked about in the year 2000, 2001, which have slowly come to pass in these last few years. Now, I, I was I was told that he made a prediction that there would be a civil war by 2005. Is that right? True. He said that there would be a well. For, let me back up on that also. Okay. John okay. also said that Y2K happened in his time, and of course it did not happen for us. So right away when he started talking about that, that was a major difference between where he came from and us. He also said that in his time, there was a civil war that started in the year 2004, 2005, but he said everyone would start shooting at each other by 2008. So right now there are sort of two sides to that camp. A lot of people are saying, oh, of course this is all baloney because that no civil war has started yet. And then I get other e emails saying, that, well, just wait because the shooting is supposed to start in 2008. Okay. And, of course, the other one is the Olympics. He said there would be no Olympics after 2004, and, of course, we just had a successful Olympics end just a few weeks ago. Yeah. Okay. Now, what... Exactly. When, when did he post the the thing about the World Trade Centers? The, did he make he made that in 1998? You said correct. Right? That was in a fax which was sent to Art Bell's show, um, in 1998. And Art Bell read this on the air in 1998. Correct. Wow. And I believe if you look hard enough, you will not only be able to find the transcript, but you'll also be able to actually find the audio of Art reading the fax. Huh. I'll see if my producer, he's he's listening now. I'll see if he can he can Google that down for us and uh, give it to us on the break. Um, but yeah, that's that's very interesting. Maybe we can post it or uh, put it up. Uh, one, once again, the number to, to reach Oliver Williams here and John Teeter, talk about him. Uh, that number is 1-800-960-2289, 800-960-2289. We welcome your calls. Also, you can reach us locally, 336-996-1596. That's 336-996-1596. Talk to us. Uh, Oliver Williams will be more than happy to field any of your questions you have about John Teeter or any of this uh, any of this time travel stuff. So let's let's talk about the the time travel vehicle itself. Um, what what did he claim to have used to to make these journeys in? Well, according to John, I guess the standard operating procedure was um, the machine itself was you know about the size of a large suitcase. Apparently, it was very heavy, 
And what they would do is put it in a vehicle that was appropriate for the time that they were going to. And then I guess the machine and the vehicle would, the whole package would travel to wherever it was they were going. And they also had the ability to take the machine out of the vehicle and put it into another one if, if need be. Hmm. Oh, interestingly enough, you mentioned that there was a diagram of the time machine on my site. And probably one of the most famous ones that he posted was the cutaway. I don't know if you've seen that or not. I believe but I have. There's a cutaway drawing that John posted that he said came from his operations manual. And for the last four or five years, people have been trying to figure out exactly what that is. Because if it's a hoax, then obviously that's some sort of a machine. It's not a time machine. And there are a couple of, I think there's one website where they're actually offering a reward to anybody who can identify that machine. And so far, no one's been able to do it. Um, really? I, I know that people have claimed to have solved the problem, but I personally haven't seen any proof that that machine is anything other than what John said it was. Huh. Huh. Okay. Wow. Well, there, there are some. I'm, I'm on your site now, actually. I'm, I'm looking around at it. Uh, about the Z machine exceeds yeah. 2 billion degrees in Kelvin, hotter than the interiors of stars. Yes, oh. and interestingly, the scientists that worked on that said it was totally unexpected. And they have no idea where that extra energy is coming from. Hmm. Well, um, I guess, go ahead, Trent. Oh, uh, well, uh, hmm, I, this just question just popped in my head. Okay, John Teeter comes back to get this IBM machine that you're talking about. Um, I guess basically my, my question is, what's stopping somebody else from getting a similar machine to come back to do other things? You know, uh, I'm, I'm not saying for evil purposes, but for more... I am, yeah, for, oh, even, sure. for anything. <clears throat> for anything, you know, that will... Or to stop him from getting what he needs. Even even despite the fact of, of what you call the divergence, um, something that will sort of throw the future into their favor. Uh, what's, what's stopping somebody? Uh, did John Teeter say anything about that? Well, um, if I understand your question correctly, my, it is why don't people use time machines to alter the future or the past to their advantage? Uh, yes. And I, I guess, you know, he talked about this. The first thing that came to my mind when you said that was, John, I think, had a radically different viewpoint about society and humanity than we do. And I, I don't think I see John doing something like that, but, of course, I could be wrong. The second thing is, in order to take advantage of a time machine and changing the future, you have to stay there. For example, if you went back in time and you knew, you know, you knew a horse race outcome and you bet on that race, there'd still be a chance that that horse would lose. So you couldn't go into the future to take advantage of that because you have to stay wherever you make the change in order for something to happen. Now, I suppose, for example, you know a stock would go up right now. So you went back to the 90s and you bought lots of Microsoft, so you might get rich doing that. But you'd have to stay there in order to take advantage of that. You couldn't go back into the future with your stock holdings. Well, because you're not going to hit the same timeline. Exactly. Well, that's true. And everywhere have... you go, there's a chance it won't turn out exactly the way that you think it will. Huh. All right. That's, that's, that's a very good question, actually. Well, now, I noticed that, that, you, that time, uh, the John Titer... John Teeter, Titer, I'm sorry. I keep mispronouncing it. Hey, you might be correct. No one's exactly sure how he pronounces his own oh, name. Okay. okay, well, I, I noticed that, that you talk about the, the Bible code here. There's a posting on your site about Revelation 13. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, again, that was a news story that I picked up and I posted. <laughs> um, that didn't come from me, but apparently some people have plugged John's name into the Bible code. And as I recall, it's gone both ways. There have, there have been some results that said this is all fake, and there have been some results that said that he was who he said he was, and he was a time traveler. Huh. All right. Well, once again, the number is 800-960-2289, 800-960-2289. Or? 336-996-1596, 336-996-1596. Now, <clears throat> excuse me. Are you going to post the uh, cutaway to the chat room? Um, no, not yet. Okay. I, I will in a second here. Okay. I was just looking around on the on the website. This is this is a, a tremendous website. I'm, I'm sure this took you a lot of work, a lot of time to put all this information together. Just the compiling aspect of it. Yeah, is, what do, yeah what I you, appreciate it. It's a challenge. We we get a tremendous amount of email, and you know, we wish we could change it, you know, more often than we do. Now, a, a lot of my a lot of my listeners have have asked, you know, why why there's no photo up, and that's something I I wanted to bring up. If that's okay with you. Oh, of me. Yeah. Oh, I have no problem with that at all. Okay. Um, you know, I, I know that, that, that there's been a lot of um, 
a lot of issues surrounding this and a lot of people. I know the government's actually interested in this John Teeter character, from what I understand, that they uh, they actually took it very, very seriously. Um, that could be true. I'll tell you, my uh, experience with that is that, of course, on our site, we can see who's coming to it. So can we. And we, you know, <laughs> we, get we know of, all about that. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we sometimes we get a lot of attention from uh, the NSA and the CIA them. and Homeland Security. You know, in my mind, I'm thinking maybe they just enjoy, you know, a good time travel story, or maybe they know something that we don't, and for some reason this is a serious issue for them. Or maybe maybe they think we know something they don't. Yeah, I mean, if they're listening, I don't know any more than, than I'm telling. <laughs> Neither do we. No, Neither that's do right. we. <laughs> time um, travel's mysterious. Okay. Oh, go ahead. I, now, the, no, the, I, the I mad... didn't have a question. I'm sorry. Oh, you didn't? No, I, okay. I did, but I forgot it. I, I, I'm sorry. Okay, the, the mad cow disease. When, did he give a time frame on that happening in the United States? Or? Yeah, like, you know, according to John, when he talked about this, it had not come to the United States yet, but of course it was in Europe, and specifically England. And he said that it was going to be a problem that would get worse and worse, and it would come to the United States. And now that I've read the post, and I know a little bit more about it, I know that mad cow can have a gestation period of up to, I think, 20 to 30 years. So he said that this is going to be a major problem in the future, and he specifically said, don't eat the meat. You know, there was lots of things he told us and warned us about, and that was one, a big one was don't eat the food that you think is safe is not safe. Yeah. So, of course, after he left, Mad Cow did come to the United States. And again, today, and I didn't get a chance to post this, but if you look it up, they are now confirming that that cow in Alabama did have Mad Cow disease. Oh, wow. And I guess this is the third one now in the United States. Huh. So, you know, take it for what it's worth. Now Mad Cow is here. Well, uh, that's only that only stands the reason with the current agricultural practices with the uh, cows. It yeah, you know, every time I hear that story, they always end up by saying, "Don't worry, it's safe because this cow did not end up in the food supply." And I'm thinking to myself, "What about all the ones yeah. that we can't test that did end up in the food exactly. supply?" Exactly. Mm. So maybe there's something to what he was saying. Yep, certainly. That's something, and that long gestation period sort of makes it a really difficult to. Um, to plot down until you know people start, you know, getting the what is it, the Creutzfeldt Jakob disease or whatever, whatever it is that mad cow gestates into in, into humans. But anyway. and according to John, this is a big problem in the next 30 years. Right. Now, why is John talks about being being in a society that's much different from ours, a, a, a complete a completely different world where there's different ideals, there's different ways that we treat one another because society has been so ravaged by war, um, by by all this stuff. Yes. You know, the John describes his future. Well, first of all, of course, according to John, Y2K did happen in his time, which led to all of these nasty things, which eventually... Um, took their time into a uh, world conflict that involved nuclear war. So according to John, they were recovering from this war. You know, it had been 10, 25 years after this war, and the United States was still recovering, and communities had grown much closer together, that this, this massive industrial complex turning out all these useless items was not part of John's world. So a lot of these things caught him by surprise, and I think he had a reaction to them while he was here. But he talked about how close he was with his family. He talked about how he lived in his community. Um, he talked about, you know, the, the way civics had changed in the future. So, yeah, he did go on and on about that quite a bit. Okay. Well, we're going to take a short break right now, and um, we're going to be back with you. Um, this is uh, it's about a four-and-a-half-minute break. So if you need to um, grab something to drink or something like that, please feel free. We're here on and, the show um, with Oliver Williams. Oliver Williams tonight. We'll take your calls when we come back in just a little bit. When it comes to karma, there are three types of people. Those that live with it, those that try to avoid it, and those that listen to Full Moon Radio. <laughs> sure, listening won't get rid of bad karma, but it will keep you entertained while you're waiting on the bad stuff to happen because of that spitball you hit your teacher with in third grade. <laughs> Full Moon Radio on the Omni Sound Radio One Network. This will not look good on a radio. 
And we're back with uh, Oliver Williams. Talking Oliver, are you about still with us? I am. Okay, All great. Right. Now I'm going to ask you the money question. Oh, really? Yeah, I know it's real. <laughs> it's real early for that because I usually hold off on this. But yeah. I want to know: Do you personally believe that John is a tie? Is what he says he is? Interesting question, and I'll I'll give you an answer. Okay. What drew me to this initially was when I first started reading it, I wanted to believe it. And I, there was a part of me that really, really believed and I wanted to believe it. And then, of course, I convinced myself that there's no way this can be true, and I walk away from it. And then something happens in the news, and I go, where did I hear that before? And I go, hey, is that John Teeter guy talked about this? And then I immediately flip over and go, oh, this has got to be true. And then I jump right back into it again. I keep reading it. Then it fades away. So I go back and forth between thinking that this might be real and how exciting it would be if time travel was a reality, and then I immediately flip over and say, you know what, there's no way this can be true. Somebody out there is telling a good story. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So I guess it would depend on what day you catch me, where I, I would tell you if it was real or not. Today, again, I'm having a hard time with this because of the news about the Z machine and Mad Cow. So today I would say, yeah, I'd really like to believe this is true. <laughs> so you go back and forth. Exactly. Okay. That's good. It's always good to have a healthy amount of, of uh, skepticism, especially for something so um, not unbelievable. unbelievable. Well, it really is. I, I guess mean, so. It's, 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 I was it's looking science, for a better word. But well, it's total science fiction. You know, if you had looked back in in nineteen, you know, in the nineteen twenties, when a lot of these uh, science fiction books were coming out, and they're saying, you know, oh, we're going to the moon, and all this, that, and the other. You know, did you, we, you, Scott? Well, I don't want to discuss my <laughs> okay. personal beliefs no, on that. No, I don't no, think no. it happened in 1969, but okay, yeah, well, I, I think we've been. Sorry, I was making a but, reference. Uh, you know, uh, yeah, exactly. But you know, well, you I know mean, I'll give you another perspective on this. In that, if you, if it's real, how does this impact our lives? And it probably doesn't. You know, you know, yeah, it'd be nifty if time travel was real. But I think on a practical level, what if this technology was real? You know, if they really do discover little black holes and they are able to do something with them. My guess would be you could probably also make some sort of a really bad weapon out of it in addition to a time machine, and maybe that will affect us. Absolutely. So could it be that John was maybe trying to warn us about that? So maybe what he was saying wasn't all real, but it was enough real to try to warn us about some of these technologies coming up. Mm-hmm. And once again, his future is not our past, but it's not his other future. Or yeah, every, like I, you that. know. This exactly. is what makes it so hard to understand because there's so many, there's so many strings involved here. You know, there's so many different, different. I, I guess you wouldn't call them dimensions, but different timelines that, yeah. that all, that are all out there. Well, you know, I think you know when you think about meeting a time traveler, everybody has an expectation of what that'll be like. You know, they'll tell you how the stock market's going to do. They're going to march right up to the White House and say, "I'm a time traveler." And when you think about it, that's not what they're going to do at all. In oh, fact, yeah. John was the exact opposite of that. And it, I think it makes sense. You wouldn't do that. I wouldn't do that. No, of course not. And also, once again, like to come back and say, I am from the future, and this is how it's going to be, is immediately going to generate expectations in people now where it won't be that, probably. I mean, you know, every action has a reaction, even involving... Yeah. You know, and, and John also stated that he did not want to be some sort of a messiah figure. He did not want people following him blindly and not paying attention to what's going on around them. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, well, I mean, yeah, of course it makes perfect it, sense. He came here for a specific thing, and um, I guess he uh, he strikes me as being reasonably altruistic without having a uh, healthy wanna, amount of ego. I want to throw you another hardball, Oliver, if you don't mind. Sure. A lot of people probably listening to this show, and they're going, well, what's in it for this Oliver guy? You know what? Where is he? Where is he making his money here? What's in it for him? Why is he? He's not identifying himself as being part of the John Teeter expectation. Uh, you know, as far as any expectations from any royalties, from any any book sales, any ballet ticket sales, any movie sales, anything like that. What's he getting out of it? How, how would you answer that question? To those um, I would say, you know, for me, it's fun. It's my 15 minutes of fame. I don't make <laughs> any money off the site. But I also like to think that what if just keeping this alive has some sort of value to it? That maybe what John was trying to say was not meant for us. It was a message for somebody else who hasn't read it yet. 
So in the back of my mind, I'm thinking, maybe this is important. It's probably not. It's probably just a lot of fun. But, you know, that's that's kind of the reason why I keep doing it. Oh, okay. Yeah. Fair enough. And it is a um, very, very, very interesting site. Yeah. Uh, we, now, once again, let me give the call-in numbers. I know there's at least 11,000 of you listening <laughs> right now. And uh, that number is 800-960-2289, 800-960-2289, or 336-996-1596, 336-996-1596. You can find them on our site, worldbeyondexplained.com. Hello out there, Michigan. <laughs> <laughs> we hear you. Yeah. Um, we broke our record last week with 12,209 listeners. Right now, we're we're just uh, we're about a thousand shy of, of breaking another one. So that's uh, yeah, congratulations cool. for us, right? Yeah. <laughs> but uh, anyway, go yeah, yeah. Oh, we want to. I want to get into. I want to get into some of the stuff that John said about the, the age in which he lives, the, or the time in which I guess in which he came from, about how things have changed and how things are totally different from the age in which we live now. Yeah. Okay. I'm ready. All right. Well, I know that he mentioned that everything, that, that people are more communal, the families are closer together, that people don't live far apart. For example, if I, li- I wouldn't live in Florida when my mom and father lived in North Carolina, for example, or I wouldn't, you know, there's no long distance there. Everything's about a communal, a communal approach. Yeah. I, I, okay, let me see. I mean, uh, I'm thinking back to the posts. I don't have them right in front of me, but I'm trying to remember some of the specifics. Um, I guess the givens are that the population in the United States was much lower than it is now. What he said was that in the nuclear conflict, specifically the large cities were targeted with nuclear weapons that apparently were designed to destroy the cities. Right. And the enemy, or whoever launched them, knew that there were people in the country that were either sympathetic to them or did not like the people in the city and that they would take over. So apparently that happened. So if you look at the Civil War, you know, I guess it's hard to decide which side John was on. Was he a good guy or a bad guy? You know, mm-hmm. nor, you know North versus South, was he a Southerner or a Northerner? So it's hard to tell what the <laughs> dynamic was there. But after that, apparently there were lots of, of course, physical problems. He described the fact that it was very, very difficult to have natural childbirth and that being able to have a baby was a big deal. Yeah. Um, he said that, of course, mad cow was a major problem. And he said that a lot of the food and livestock was grown locally and there were no huge, you know, there were no Walmarts. Where Thank, you could God. Thank God. <laughs> yeah. so there was no place where you could go and buy, you know, huge manufactured products. So that was the other difference that he made. Yeah. Um, I'm trying to think what else would pertain to this. I guess, oh, the other thing he said was that the politics in the United States had changed, that there was no longer one president, that the United States had split up into five separate regions that worked together, huh. and each one of those regions had their own president. And the national government was comprised of, you know, the same types of governing bodies, but instead of one president, there were five, and then they were replaced on a rotating basis. And he said that the reason that they did this was so that um, foreign policy didn't change so radically when the administrations would come in and go out. Um, He said that as a result of that, politics was more local, that the things that affected you in your daily life were, you know, more in a county region, and that communities were... They stayed together. They stuck together. Everybody knew who their family was. Older people were revered. And that's that's kind of the picture that he painted. Hmm. Huh. So this uh, notion of sort of a not knowing your neighbor like we, we see today was not was not a thing in his well, it's time. a thing of the past. I mean, if you're talking about sharing water supplies, I mean, how, how does the water so – yeah, that, that's a good question. How has the water supply changed? Because I'm assuming all these large – uh, municipalities that handle this kind of thing isn't happening anymore. Yeah, and as you know, as a matter of fact, that according to John was the reason why they had to come back and get the IBM because as they were recovering these systems, a lot of them were run by these older mainframes, and they didn't work anymore. And that's why they needed to come back in time to get this computer to get those systems working. So. Okay. They were trying to recover all the old credit card information and get the water plants working, et cetera, et cetera. Hmm. All right. 
And so did, did he mention anything about the terms of these presidents, who these presidents might be? Um, no, he didn't mention anything about the presidents in his time, but he did specifically make reference to a couple of presidents in our time. And, of course, the one was in 2009 when he made mention that we may have a female president. Yeah. So we didn't say who it was or why, but well, we all it have is a interesting feeling. that, that yeah, that's we, a real possibility now. We have educated guesses. We have a feeling that. who that who that could possibly be. <laughs> well, I mean, um, actually, two different possibilities. Well, two different possibilities, okay. True, but, you know, think back in, what, the year 2000, that would have been a ridiculous thing if somebody had said that to you. Oh, well, yeah. yeah, it definitely would have been. And, uh, you know, especially... With all the, you know, with, with all the things that have gone on now, you can definitely see it as a possibility. Uh-huh. Um, oh, I mean, well, and and of course, also he states that's when, I guess it gets pretty ugly if there's a civil conflict. So I could see that happening too. Yeah. yeah. Now, I want to mention the number again, and um, it's eight hundred nine six zero two two eight nine. We know you're out there. We just broke. Uh, we just broke a record. We're over 15,000. <laughs> That's stupid. <laughs> That's uh, crazy. 800 960 2289 or 336 996 1596. Call us up. Give us your questions. Oliver will be more than happy to answer them for you. Oh, or you can uh, get on the chat room. You can get in the chat room from worldoftheunexplained.com. Filling up pretty it well. It is filling up pretty good. And uh, there's email too, Scott. Yeah, and, and no. Roy Mercer would not like to have a, a word with me, Ivan Eason, <laughs> on the chat line. Um, so somebody, uh, you know, call in if you have any questions about this. We'll be more than happy to, to let you talk with Oliver. Yeah. Okay. All right. Let's uh, go back to this time machine idea. If you can take this thing with you in, in, any ve- in any vehicle, if it's the size of a suitcase, and you're virtually, I mean, you're traveling light. You can go anywhere yeah. with anything. Um, does, does he mention the kind of vehicle he traveled back with um yeah actually (laughs) okay this is where the story gets a little weird and it's so weird that it's one of those elements where you go this had to have been made up because it's so strange why would somebody put that in their made-up story okay according to john he had to go back to 1975 and they had a hard time finding a vehicle i guess the vehicle has to have uh, heavy enough a suspension to hold this this heavy machine so according to John, they actually used a Corvette to come back to 1975 with this machine. Huh. A and I guess he did whatever he needed to do in 1975. And he said that when he got to 1998, he didn't realize that the car was going to draw that much attention. Because apparently when he showed up at his parents, um, they were very surprised at the vehicle he had. And they said, look, if you're trying to not be noticed that is not the not kind of car you know. yeah. <laughs> so apparently he got rid of that car and he got another one which was a i guess it was a chevy suburban okay and okay. i guess that was what he used to to go home in so if that's true i mean somebody out there is driving around in a corvette that came from the year 2036 and would that go for a lot on eBay, man? Oh, my God. Can you imagine the bidding now? <laughs> not to mention the chicks. Yeah, definitely. That is kind of weird, though. It really is. Yeah, it, but. You know, it's, just, it's one of those things where you're like, what? You know, it's, you know, why make something that ridiculous up if it wasn't true? It's just one of those things that, that just, it's very strange. At least it wasn't a DeLorean, right? <laughs> I mean, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> then we would definitely have some, some issues on yeah. believability there. Um, um that's, that's insane. Have you have you personally spoken, ever spoken to anyone um, in the Teeter family or claiming to be in the Teeter family? Well, uh, let me. And not in the family. No, okay. I haven't. Um, I have tried on numerous occasions to get a hold of Larry, but he has not returned any of my emails. In really? fact, it's just recently that he's, you know, come out within the last month and started talking about this. So, hopefully, I can get a hold of him and maybe we can find something out after that. Oh, that'd be great, Larry. If you're listening, give us a call. <laughs> We'd all well, like know, to hear from you. The other thing I want to mention is there are people out there, and I'm sure they're probably listening now too, who did speak with John or and have email conversations with him while he was here. Okay. And in fact, I, in fact, I had a brief email exchange with one of them today. Her name is Pamela, and I'm sure she's listening. So I would urge her to give you a call because I'm sure she could tell you a lot more than I could personally mm-hmm. about what kind of guy John was. Oh, that'd be great, Pamela. Yeah. If you're listening, we're on about a two-minute delay here, but Pamela, if you're listening, please give us a call, eight hundred nine six zero two two eight nine, and let us know what's going on here. Yeah, that's true. Now, did she did she actually meet John in the flesh? Um, I don't think so. I know that she was actually one of the first people that responded to him 
when he said, hey, I'm a time traveler, I'd love to talk to you. And it's also my understanding that they, they had emails that were sent back and forth to each other, and I think they may have spoken on the phone, but I'm not sure. Oh, okay. okay. I guess, and a larger question is, has, did anybody besides his family, of course. Oh, we've, okay, we've got, we've got a, a caller. caller. Just a second, Oliver. Well, I thought we had... There yeah, we there. Caller, you're on the air. Hi, it's uh, Scott from Omaha. I've got a question for Oliver. Okay, yeah, I'm right here. I'm, I'm curious, did John say anything about, uh, like, a time traveler, tra time traveling for recreational purposes, like if people would, uh, from the future, choose to go back and view a historical event? Maybe something um, like he, the crucifixion of Jesus or something that you think would attract a lot of interest? Interesting that you brought that up. Yes, specifically, I think he said that in the future that was probably a possibility. But one of the other limitations he said his machine had, and specifically the one he had, was that it was only accurate up to about 60 years of travel. So if you were to try to go past that, you would end up in a universe that was so weird it looked nothing like what you were expecting. And in fact, he used the Christ example. He said, if you got in my machine, tried to go back 2,000 years, you would end up somewhere where Christ not, might not even have been born. And but he also he said that they were considering it. using time travel as a way to um, punish criminals, that they would banish them somewhere other than where they were and just send them to another time where they wouldn't have to worry about them there. Hmm. Yeah, uh, you, you think if, if, uh, if people could choose a time like that, that history would just would be full of reports of, like, you know, all sorts of strange people showing up at at events that and hardly anybody there would actually be indigenous to the area you know there'd be thousands of time travelers all looking at uh, well you know, consider this events. according to John since there are an infinite number of universes you could go to it might be unusual to see more than one or two time travelers show up in your lifetime so it's possible that we're living in a time now that was affected by a time traveler and maybe what you're describing actually did happen we just don't recognize it and that might also explain that paradox of if there are time travelers, then where are they? You would yeah, like well, in addition, yeah, why would a time traveler come forward and tell you who he was? You know, that logic has always escaped me. If I was a time traveler, I don't think I would tell anybody where I came from. Yeah, no right. joke. Yeah. Well, thanks a lot, Scott, and uh, thanks. Thanks we're going to open call. the lines back up. All right, so, so we're waiting on Pamela if you're out there listening, because oh, yeah. we, we definitely want to hear this. Yeah, that's an interesting that thing. Was great, yeah, it was a great question. I was actually thinking about Recreational the, time travel. The recreational aspect of and actually, 60 years. Yeah, and, and then then the other notion of these multiple universes and banishing criminals. You know, that's that's an interesting form of punishment. And their presence in these alternate realities would, of course, may have some influence on, on those realities. I mean, it, it, it gets absurdly It could get really bad. Yeah, yeah I, I mean, think his reference was they were... You know, and he might have been joking, but he said that uh, they were considering sending hardened criminals to the Stone Age so that nobody would have to worry about them. <laughs> no. <laughs> and that would be true. Talk about a sentence. Wow. Yeah, yeah the guidelines would be that go crazy. I, I guess it's better than being hung, though. I yeah. guess so, yeah. <laughs> yeah. You get to no. try to survive and live, <laughs> eke out your life. And, what, what, did yeah. John, what did John say about, about uh, criminal punishment in, in, in the year 2036? Um, I, you know... Based on what he said and how he described the future, I don't think they suffered criminals at all. I think that if you got caught stealing or doing anything that was detrimental to the society, they took care of you immediately. Oh. And, uh, you know, another interesting thing he talked about, I remember somebody asking him if there was any um, prejudice where he came from. And he said, yes, there is. He said that we are prejudiced against people that don't carry their weight. You know, in a time when everyone's suffering and you're trying to recover from a war, Nobody cares if you're black or white or if you're gay or straight. We only care if you do the work required oh, yeah. to keep us all going. Because of so he said, yes, that type of prejudice definitely did exist in the future. Of course. It's, it's I mean, more yeah. of a, it, it goes back to a more um, Older. bestial kind of, um, you know, survive or, you know, or die kind of mentality. Maybe not quite Mad Max, but more like a, you know, communal... Yeah, like you were saying earlier. You know. Do your job well, or else. Yeah. Wouldn't it be great if we could be that way now without having to go through the war? Yeah. I think that's kind of the message. Yeah, oh, yeah. yeah. And, and I, it would be. You know, I mean, a, a better a better way to treat each other, a better way to treat people. You know, without without all the all the all the stuff that we put up with today. Um, you know? and, and maybe the notion that uh, you know, everybody not only carries their weight but feels a sense of purpose. You know, I think that's my own personal role two cents about that you know a faceless society 
basically and people do sort of feel lost maybe and they they wouldn't be you know they would have a, a renewed sense of yeah, and you know, I, I think John made this comment over and over again. He said that the fact that the war did not happen for us was worse, and that you know he had no love for our society. In fact, he said a lot of nasty things about the way we live our life in general, and that we would suffer as a result of not going through that war and ending up in that position. Yeah, yeah. Now, as, as Pamela, I, I got. I'm looking in the chat room right now. We got a, a guy in our chat room that's normally in here. He's, he's asking, is, is she from Anomalies? Yes. Okay. Now, this is interesting because this just got cleared up for me today. When I first started the site, I was inundated with people claiming to be Pamela, and I had no way of knowing who was who. And just recently, I received an email, and I looked, and I Googled it, and I found out that it was the same email that was showing up on all these other sites. And yes, Anomalies was one of them. Okay. So, to my understanding... The Pamela that's on Anomalies is the one that did speak with John. Okay, okay. because this, this person in our chat room, um, he, he says he knows her. So um, if you know her, Max, uh, give her a give her a buzz or something and tell her to call in. Yes, that's right. <laughs> yeah, I'll tell you, if you go, in fact, I put the link on our website. I think okay. it's theparanormal.net. There is a, a chat going on in there or a forum where they're talking about Larry's interview on Coast to Coast, and she's been posting in there, too. Okay. I'm looking at that now. Oh, yeah. Um, right. Let's see. Okay, well, oh, there was a question before the caller came in. Oh, uh, Basically, uh, a larger issue of did anybody besides John's immediate family actually speak to him in the flesh and in person? Did any of the people he communicated with, did um, any of them have any personal contact with him? My belief is yes, but it's not something he talked about online. Okay. Um, John, you know, when you look at the posts and you see the dates and the times where John was posting, uh -huh. he had some sort of a schedule, but there were large periods of time where he would completely disappear, and then he would come back and he would talk a lot. One of those times was during the 2000 election. So, yes, I believe John was out there doing something. It just, he didn't talk about it online. Right, it was more of a face-to-face -face meetings and uh, very quiet ones at that. I imagine. Okay, I'm, I'm looking right now. I'm, I'm, I got my producer sent me a, uh, a link here, and I'm looking through it. I'm trying to see if he said he thought the transcript was here, and I don't see it. So, okay, well, try it again. Uh, okay. <laughs> Go ahead. <clears throat> no, that was that was basically my my question about the uh, that I had before the caller. Um, oh, he's he's got his hands full right now. Over 200 station relays are, are picking up this feed right my now. My gosh. So, uh, okay, yeah, he's Ooh. busy. <laughs> all right. Um, so, all in all, then, you, you've, got a, you've got a guy that comes back. He makes these predictions. Some of them come true. Some of them don't. And that's why you're still sitting here scratching your head sometimes going, well, you know, maybe so, maybe not. I don't know. We want to know what you think out there listening. 800-960-2289. Or 336-996-1596. Let us know. Do you believe... And John Teeter, Titer, whatever you want to call him. Do you believe he's an actual time traveler? Or do you believe this is a really, really elaborate hoax that's been coming out to all kinds of, you know, there, there's all kinds of penumbras that have stretched away from this this whole story. That's true. Um, it, it's just amazing. It really is when you when you see all the time that it would have taken if this were in fact a hoax. There's just so many things out there that you know who would put the kind of time it would take into into, into creating all these things that's true that's i guess that's my big question you know for you oliver i mean you know you're looking at all this information who would have the time to actually really sit down and do this well it's an interesting question because if you think about it you look back at the time frame where this all started if if it did start in 1998 and maybe they were testing out their story and they were fine tuning the details with art then they came back in 2000 did what they did online, but then you have to consider um, whoever did this knew about the IBM 5100, they knew how to draw, they knew how to draft, they knew enough about physics to make a good story. There were so many disciplines that they had to have some knowledge of and be a good guesser that I think it would be very difficult for a single person to pull this off if it was a hoax. Mm, yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, if it, it would have to be probably by committee. Which right, means... so somebody out there, if it's a hoax, you know, it's very difficult to keep a conspiracy. Somebody out there has to know the truth about this. That's true. Okay, here, here we go. I've got, I've got the facts transcript from the Art Bell show, and Art Bell read this on the air in 1998. Shall you read it? I'm going to read it right now. Oh, my gosh. Dear Art, 
I had to fax when I heard other time travelers calling in from the past time year 2500 AD. Let me explain. Time travel was invented in 2034. Offshoots of certain successful fusion reactor research allowed scientists at CERN to produce the world's first contained singulatary engine. The basic design involves rotating singularities inside a magnetic field. By altering the speed and direction of rotation, you can travel both forward and backward in time. Time travel can be understood in terms of connected lines. When you go back in time, you travel on your original timeline. When you turn the singularity engine off, a new timeline is created due to the fact that you and your time machine are now there. In other words, a new universe is created. To get back to your original line, you must travel a split second farther back and immediately throw the engine into forward without turning it off. Some interesting outcomes of this are, you meet yourself, and I've done it off. I've done it off and even taken a younger version of myself along for a few rides before returning myself to the new timeline and going back to mine. You can alter history in the new universe that you've created. Most of the time changes are subtle. The oldest one is a skyscraper that doesn't exist well, that don't exist in New York. Interestingly, when you travel in time, you must compensate for the orbit of the Earth since the time machine doesn't move. You have to adjust the engine so you remain on the planet when you turn it off. Now for the future, you might want to know why 2K is a disaster. Many people die on the highways when they freeze to death trying to get to warmer weather. The government tries to keep power by instituting martial law, but all of, it, all of it collapses when their efforts to bring power back up fail. A few years later, communal government system is developed after the Constitution takes a few twists. China retakes Taiwan. Israel wins the largest battle for their life, and Russia is covered in nuclear snow from their collapsed reactors. That's the first facts. Wow. So now the question is, was that John, or was that somebody using that as a basis for being John? Huh. Who knows? You know, that, that's true. But it was just something that I was thinking about, that this, this phenomenon is one, a, a very modern phenomenon in the sense that it's purely, that it involves the Internet, you know, um, and it, it goes both ways, that if, if it's real information, then it's spread quickly, and if it's false information, then other people can spread false information, and there's really no way of, of being able to determine, you know, to, what's going on. It, it becomes very difficult to try to sift through facts. I mean, I guess maybe you could determine writing styles or something like that. I, I don't know. Uh, what do you think about that? Yeah, actually, I have seen there has been an effort to take John's writings and run them through some sort of a statistical analysis so they could try to figure out who they were. And it, it, to my understanding, they don't have any definitive proof about who exactly John was. And I guess, you know, again, that's part of the mystery. It's the closer you get, the more questions that come up. Mm -hmm. So, you know, wh whoever wrote that fax, if you look at the details, some of them are wrong. There are slight differences in the stories. But again, then again, that was pre-Y2K. If it was John, it sounds to me like he was expecting Y2K to happen, and it didn't. I'm going to post this in the chat room. That's a good idea. And we're going to go we're ahead take and a take a break. If you'll stick, hang tight with us here, we're going to be back with Oliver Williams. Um, this next break, um, this next break is, is going to be about four minutes. So just to let you know, Oliver. And uh, if you'll hang tight, we'll be back with you here in just a moment on World, World. of the Unexplained. Here we go. This will not look good on a resume. You're listening to. And we're back. Yeah, sorry about that. I ended up playing two files at once. Hey, Obviously, isn't that great? we may not be that the professional, professional as as the ad goes for us. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we're 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 back with Oliver Williams of John T John Teeter John Titer dot com, whatever you want to call it. Check out the website, guys, and uh, please give us a call here eight hundred nine six zero two two eight nine eight hundred nine six zero two two eight nine or. 336-996-1596, 336-996-1596, okay. and let us know what you think. Are you still there with us? Uh, absolutely. Okay. Uh, now, this is one thing, I guess, and it, it sort of brings a sort of more real element to it, um, or danger, I guess. Uh, we were talking on the phone a second ago, and, and you told me that... Uh, you guys have been receiving uh, death threats. The attorney has been receiving death threats from mysterious sources. Uh, could you tell us a little bit about that? Oh, sure. Um, the One of the first things that happened when we put our website up was that we started getting a lot of email from people who were very, very threatened by what we were doing. And I'm not 
sure I understood why. You know, we get a lot of email where everything is capitalized and every word you couldn't say to your kid. And, you know, we got a lot of email like that. <laughs> but then we started getting email where people were saying, if I find you, I will harm you. And oh so that God. sort of spooked my family a little bit. And at the same time, we were going onto the net. And, of course, this is when Larry Haber started coming, um, coming about. And when people found out about that, they immediately researched his family. They found pictures of his kids. Um, I think me. there's a story out there where he talked about people showing up at the school and taking pictures of his kids. No. There was a satellite image that showed you exactly how to get to his house. So, of wow. course, I wasn't anxious to have that experience, which is why, of course, you know, I, I tend not to tell a lot of people exactly who I am and what I do. I, I can understand That's, that. uh, That's yeah, we, probably we a wise wanna, course of action. We don't want to bring any, any of that information out for, for any of those people. Yeah. Uh, just a bunch of jerks. Um, once yeah. again, at call in numbers 800-960-2289. Um, we'd really love to hear from you if you're out there, Pamela, because we would like um, that, that site that I put up there on the, in the chat room, that link um, actually has some of Pamela's postings as well as uh, some of the transcripts from the, uh, the transcript from the call. Hmm. So um, check that out. Well, well, anyway, going back into the, the, um, the, the new year, the 2036 year, this this time that, that John supposedly came from, um, what what else is going on there besides this this whole communal? We've got five different presidents. We've got um, a problem because of the civil war. Is is there any nuclear disasters? I mean, any any really large scale nuclear disasters that we need to be aware of that that have happened? Well, he pretty much, you know, suggested that if you lived in a major city, that it wasn't a very safe place to be. Shortly. But he also said that the danger was going to be obvious, and the people who died chose to stay and die. Mm -hmm. So I guess when that day comes, it's not going to be a big surprise. He, he said that. Um, he talked a little bit about the military. He talked about where he was from. Um, his unit apparently is based in Florida at, uh, I guess, what was once MacDill Air Force Base in Tampa. Okay. And uh, I'm trying to think what else he talked about. Um, he talked a little bit about his family. He said that when he was a boy, um, growing up after the war, that his father had a sailboat, and what they did was deliver oranges up and down the coast of Florida, and they put 12-volt electrical systems together for people. So I guess yeah. that's what John did when he was a boy. Mm -hmm. um, after he went to school after the war, apparently he had a... Uh, education in history, and since he had experience in the war, um, you know, he was actually a soldier in the war, that's how he got tapped to uh, do this mission. And when you speak of this, when he spoke of the Civil War, I mean, what were the, the factions? Was it really a, a five-way fight, or did it sort of gradually deteriorate in, into something like that? Yeah, he, the only thing he said which comes to mind right now is that, of course, the beginnings of the Civil War happened in 2004-2005 and which some people have even argued that's happening now. And of course the shooting starts in 2008, and it was basically some sort of a division between people who lived in cities, people who lived in the country. I don't know if they were fighting over food or power or heat or whatever, but he said that was the impetus of the war. And the war ended when the cities were destroyed in a nuclear attack uh, on the United States. So what it looks like is that John, on his side, was allied with whoever attacked the cities in the United States. Hmm. Wow. Okay. Well, and did he, uh, these nuclear attacks, they, they came from within, or they were... No, he said that the, the nuclear conflict is between Russia, China, the United States, and Europe. Hmm. And that, you know, all of the major countries, you know, Europe was hit. I don't exactly know who hit who, but the Chinese, the Europeans... Um, the Russians and the United States did exchange nuclear weapons. Hmm. But he also said they were not huge tactical hydrogen bombs, that they were much smaller nuclear devices, which were specifically designed to just destroy um, buildings and cities and leave the relatively area around the cities unharmed. And at the time, of course, that was a ridiculous notion. And then it was, I think it was a couple of years ago, and I think it's even on our site somewhere, the United States military came out and said, yes, we are now developing nuclear weapons to do just that. More uh, strategic surgical yeah, weapons. Yeah, smaller weapons that are designed to 
destroy smaller targets and not completely wipe out a civilization. Now, I first heard about this this John Teeter phenomenon when I was in law school, and a, a, a buddy of mine actually turned me on to the site because I told him what I was going to do with the radio show when I got out and everything. And, and uh, he was like, you know, you need to check this out. This is some crazy stuff, and a lot of these predictions have come true. He said, and I've been following it for a while. And he, I don't know if um, if he had misread this or if it's actually on the, on the post, but he had said something about Jacksonville, Florida, which is where we went to law school at, which is where we lived at the time, was going to sustain a major nuclear attack in the year, of, in the year 2005. Well, he didn't say 2005. I think he said it was closer to 2015. Okay. But John, you know, in his postings, does have a personal memory of seeing the attack and watching Jacksonville get hit. So wherever he was at that point, I I can't do the calculation. I know how old he would be, 2015. But apparently he was old enough to fight, and he was fighting in the Civil War when that happened. Hmm. And he he was cheering. Apparently that was something that was good for them. Oh, wow. Huh. Well, you know, Jack- Jacksonville isn't that bad of a place. I don't think. <laughs> you know, it's, uh, it's got a nice bridge. Yeah, it does have nice bridges, neon lights, and yeah. neat little things like that, a lot okay. of bars. Um, <laughs> like I said, not a bad place. Um now, as, as John referred in this in this reference letter um, on um, on the Art Bell show, he referred is, to. Is he referred to specifically? Well, no, we're the, the transcript that we had, that I'd read out earlier, the the facts that he sent Art Bell in, in 1998, where he talked about seeing himself and another time zone picking himself up and taking him with him on some of these trips. Do, right. Did he make any postings about that? No. See, that was that's one of the details that, you know, for lack of a better term, our John did not talk about. So, you know, a lot of the critics of the story say, aha, there is a detail that he couldn't work out or it didn't work out or he was lying about it or whatever. But no, he specifically did not talk about that anymore. Um, He did say he was on training missions and he talked about being with an instructor. In fact, one of the pictures I think that's on our site he claimed was taking during a training mission where you see the laser beam being bent. Yeah, yeah, I saw that. Uh Uh-huh. And so that was the only reference he made to traveling to other places. Why would why would John? And I, I guess the the obvious reason is, or the obvious answer to this might be because he didn't want to, because the community is so tight now. But but my question is, why wouldn't John leave, and stay in a, in a better place, or you know, go back sixty years, live out his life, you know, have have, you know, why wouldn't he stay? Well, you know, after reading his post, getting sort of an idea what kind of a person he was. I think that his mission, his honor, his family, where he came from was more important to him than that. Uh-huh. You know, I think that says something about maybe his value system, which is different than ours. As a matter of fact, I remember there was an exchange with somebody where they pointed out to John, they said, hey, you know, you've got a tremendous weapon there that you could pretty much do anything you wanted with. And he responded by saying, you know, I'm surprised by that because. I see a device to get my mission done. Everybody that I'm talking to here sees a bomb, and I think that said something about our society. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. And we're always, so. you know, trying to one-up the next guy. I mean, that's that's America for you. And I think that that points to the fact he was he thought about society and life and and things like that radically differently than, than we do. Yeah. And, uh, I mean, like I said, it's a, it's a good value system, and it's something that, that, in a way, a lot of people do want to believe in, even if it's not true. It, it just the idea of being able to work in a community together, to be uh, close to one's relatives, one's family, one's... Be, well, he... Have importance. You know, there were times when John lost his cool, and he would berate us as a group. You know, and one of his comments was, you know, we are nothing but selfish, you know, uh, sheep you know, following, going right off the cliff, and he was angry that we didn't understand the Constitution. He was angry that, you know, nobody knew what the Ten Commandments were. I mean, all these value systems that we take for granted, he was very upset that we had no idea what he was talking about. Yeah, I think it is curious that you mentioned the con- that he mentioned the Constitution because, you know, that's true. I mean, a lot of people, even, yeah, yeah. Even, even as a law student, I really didn't understand the Constitution until I went to, you know, constitutional law one and two, you know, I mean, and mm-hmm. then, then it breaks it down and you really start thinking about these things. And I don't think most people in America really know not only, you know, what their rights are, but, but you know, what the government stances on some of those rights, you know, have been and how they've changed over the course of different, you know, judges, different Supreme Courts, different legislation. You know, yeah, I mean, he, especially he the was very upset about that, and he warned us over and over again that it was going to be taken away from us. Yeah. Hmm. 
Now, now John mentioned in one of his posts that he, he believes in Jesus Christ and that they pray to God in churches. Yes. Um, and I think that's, you know, that that's, uh, you know, you'd mentioned the Ten Commandments and everything like that. Now, are there other religions going on in, in John's time? Um, he didn't say anything about other religions, but, you know, based on some of the other things he said, I don't think that would have been a big deal. You know, again, it goes back to, you know, I really don't care what God you pray to as long as you, you tend your part of the field and, you know, make sure the bears don't attack. Yeah. Hmm. I, just, I just find it interesting that, that, that Christ is... Um, you know that Christ is such a big part of that. Yeah, he he made no bones about the fact that he. You know, actually, there's some contention over this. He said Gnostic, uh-huh. but there's other people out there that that thought he meant agnostic because uh, a lot of the things John said um, agreed with this offshoot sect of Christianity. Yeah, the the agnostic sect. So you know, a lot of people think that's what he was. Oh. Now, how have hospitals changed? How has medicine changed? Since this. Uh, that was something else he talked about also. He said that the health care system in the future was nowhere near what it looks like now, and that basically if you got a disease and it was your time to die, then you died, and that doctors were much more concerned about delivering healthy babies, fixing broken bones, things like that. Either there weren't enough doctors to go around or too many people were dying that they couldn't take care of, I would guess. Yeah. Well, I know you mentioned that AIDS had not been cured and, and cancer has made progress. Yeah, that was one of the other questions that was asked. And he said that, <laughs> no, they, they haven't solved AIDS, but that was one of the predictions he made. He said that they were using virus cells to treat cancer. And, of course, just a couple of years ago, that's exactly the path they're on now to fight cancer. All right. Mm. What, what about entertainment? What do people do? Um... Entertainment, according to John, again, well, I guess this goes back to the web. Yeah. He said that the Internet was comprised of nodes that were independently powered, and they were basically set up everywhere. So what he was describing was basically a wireless system. But at the time, of course, nobody knew what he was talking about. He said that um, these huge companies that were making, that were broadcasting over the airways were gone, and that everything was over the Internet. So if you wanted a television show you went to the internet. You wanted a radio show, you went to the internet. So apparently music, you know, TV, movies, whatever it was they were doing was all distributed over the internet hmm. in his time. Huh. Sounds good for us. So, it sounds real good for us. <laughs> Omnisound Radio 1, the wave of the future. I, I told you people years ago, and you wouldn't... Bl- no. Okay, so... You know, it's, you know, if you think That's about, about it, enough of if any of this comes to pass... Somewhere on the internet in 30 years, they're gonna, you know, dig this this file up and listen to it, and they'll be bewildered. Oh yeah, oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Look at those um, guys on the show, they don't. Now, okay. does, does John ever mention any any of these? Uh, you know, you've heard there's there's a lot of talk now about these microchips. You know, a lot of a lot of people will say it's you know the the new world order, the antichrist. The you know they're they're gonna microchip us all, and we're gonna. You know, to buy to buy anything, to buy food, to buy uh, any supplies we need, we'll be using these in the future, kind of like a scan of ourselves to, for for money. Is there any mention of um, of how that how money has changed hands in, in the future? Um, you know, I'm thinking back. I remember he he made comments when he was angry. You know, along the lines of, you know, if you let this go far enough, you're all going to get chipped, and then see how you like that. But I don't think he specifically made any reference to that. I could be wrong about that. Okay. But I don't recall him saying anything about that specifically. Mm-hmm. Or the notion of, um, well, if everything is, is more communal and the United States at least is divided five ways, that, um, large, as you said before, there would be no Walmarts, but are there any other kind of corporations that sort of, uh, okay, I'll trade with country A, B, C, and D, you know? Yeah, he, I mean, let me how, think about that for a second. He said... You know, the overall theme seems to be decentralization on a massive scale, from Uh government, production, food, everything. But he did say, uh, he said, of course, Omaha, Nebraska was the new capital of the United States. Oh, wow. And that our largest trading partner was Russia. So whoever John got along with, you know, apparently they got along with the Russians. Hmm. That's a... Well, that's that's good for you. Trent Trent speaks almost fluent Russian. Yeah. For, for those of you out there that, that don't know, he uh, yeah. he's very well, actually. I, yeah. I guess that <laughs> begs the question then: Were the Russians the ones that attacked our cities? You know, were that's they were question. they the ones that John's side of the conflict was allied with? 
that's a good question, especially yep. with the destruction of Jacksonville. Yeah. Um, what about the nature of the world in general? I mean, uh, you know, you, you mentioned Europe and, and China. What about Japan, uh, Africa, South America? What do you say um, about that? You know, people did ask specifically about various countries. I'll see if I can remember what I can remember off the top of my head. He said um, Japan, Taiwan, um, a lot of those countries in Asia would be absorbed by China. Um, or annexed, I think was the word he used. Um, apparently, they did suffer damage in whatever the war was. He said Europe got hit. He said Australia, they rebuffed a invasion by China, and apparently they became very isolationist. He talked about Canada a little bit, didn't say too much about South America. Um, he said that Spanish was much more popular in the um, you know, Texas, Nebraska, I'm sorry, Texas, Arizona, the, those border states, you said, you know, you kind of made an offhanded joke about that, which leads me to believe something happened there. <laughs> so I'm trying to think if there's anything else specifically. That's all I can remember off the top of my head. Okay. okay. So you, uh, we've got a, um, an affiliate in Omaha, Nebraska, actually. It's an AM station that carries our program. And uh, they're in the chat room right there. And when you mentioned Omaha being the capital, they go, Omaha, all right. <laughs> well, <laughs> well, apparently that's where John's family moved. So they were in Florida, and they now live somewhere in Omaha. Huh. Now, are, are we talking about the, the John Teeter? Yeah, John's family currently? in our time. Okay, okay, all right. So according to Larry, they were in Florida. And, you know, they moved, of course, right before all the hurricanes hit. So which begs the question, did John warn them? And then they all took off. But, yeah, they do reside in Omaha now, according to Larry. Hmm. Okay. Let me, let me give that number out again. Or you go ahead, Trent. Go, okay, give sure. them the numbers. Uh, the, the, oh, oh, wait a minute. Wow. Well, Don't we've need got, to. A we've caller. got a caller. All right. Hang on just a second, caller. Caller, you're on the air. Hi. Hi. Oh. What a great show tonight. <laughs> it's Laura. Okay. <laughs> Hi, Scott and Trent. Hi, Laura. Hey, Laura. Hi. Hey, I wanted to know if um, John ever mentioned anything about... Um, uh, psychics, how they do, how they're able to look into the future. Wow, interesting question. No, I don't think he specifically said anything about psychics. However, you know, this is interesting. He did say, now that you mention it, that there was a theory that because of all these multiple universes, that there was some sort of a link between each version of ourselves and these other universes. Hmm. And he said that when we think about things that happened in the past, that we're actually accessing the memories of one of ourselves, is actually experiencing that right now. And when we have a premonition or we think about the future, we're actually accessing the memory of, of one of us that's actually living that, but in the future. So he so said that they, they theorized there was some overall connection hmm. between all the versions of ourselves in time that explained memory and premonition. So that's sort of the dimensional aspect right. of it. That oh. when you right now, when you think about something that happened to you a year ago, mm -hmm. your brain is actually tapping into another version of yourself that's experiencing that right now. Wow, that oh. really that's amazing. <laughs> so I would assume then that um, that people that are able to access those different dimensions also that with that same um, theory would apply to dreams. You yeah, know, I, you're, suppose, you're I suppose that would be true, and maybe some people can do it better than others. Hmm. Yeah, interesting. I, I always wondered if um, anyone had any ideas on what that was. Okay. All right. Well, uh, thanks, Laura. Hey, thanks, you're Laura. You're welcome. All right. thanks, so, so, thanks so much for having us on. Oh. <laughs> All right. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. And that, that's Laura from Full Moon Radio. She's a she's a DJ for another one of our um, shows on Omni Sound Radio 1 Network. Um, she's She's actually a psychic. And uh, she does give readings. Um, she does a show on Wednesday night where she gives readings, and you can call in. And, and, um, Is there a show? Yeah, and it's on Sunday night. It's on. No, well, she, she has a regular show on Sunday, Sunday night, night and, then and then she has the, the reading show. No, it's not a rebroadcast. It's, a, it's a, a show where she actually gives readings at 11 p.m. To, to midnight Eastern Standard Time. I'm just going to shut up, Scott. Oh, no, it, it's okay. <laughs> no, I mean, I was just, I'm just saying, she does a regular show. I, I think it's uh, it comes on at 9 p.m. On, on Sunday nights, the regular show does. Um, but... Um, Anyway, go ahead, Trent. No, I, I, I asked that question about other countries. Um, the nuclear war, the civil war, communal society. I'm running through the things that I was going to talk about. Um, uh, it's interesting, though, that Russia it, it plays such a major part in this thing, you know, because yeah. a lot of people feel 
uh, at least now in the United States, a lot of the popular opinion is that Russia is no longer a threat. Well, it, it, you know, since you bring that up, it just occurred to me a couple of times John made mention, he said the Russians are not our enemy, that they may appear that way now, but when push comes to shove, they are not the United States' enemy. Oh, oh that's, that's, a, that's a good thing to know. Yeah, they, I, <clears throat> I guess that makes sense. Also, um, do you have, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. What? I, I, was, I was looking at one of the chat room comments. Do you have on something predictions... December predictions? What? what? I don't know. I can't. Okay, I can't read it from here. So. Go ahead. Um, <laughs> but he he mentioned the Russians were not our enemies, but he didn't exactly mention who were our enemies then. Um, besides China, maybe. I, I mean, yeah. I don't know I, you know, I'm, I don't know how would you know. There's so many things that could happen. You're fighting one side. You know, look back to the civil war that we had already. You know, uh, France and England were hip deep in that conflict through the whole thing. You know, mm -hmm. France, I think, was uh, supplying one side with not the, so yeah, the Civil War was supplying one side with arms, and England was was uh, sending ships to fight the other. So yeah, that's true. I mean, the cotton they they wanted that cheap cotton that we had down here. So I'm sorry, actually, yeah. I'm thinking about the Revolutionary War. If it wasn't for France oh, supporting the colonists, then the Revolutionary War would not have turned out the way that it did. So yeah. who knows if Russia didn't play a similar role? in our next civil war. That's true. We have we've, a, we've got another caller call. here. You're on the air. Hi. I'm sorry, we we can't hear you, caller. We're having we can't hear you at all. You're you're, you're breaking up. Can can you hear us? Okay, well yeah, maybe it was John. <laughs> <laughs> that oh. would have been weird, huh? <laughs> Little E V P action going on there. Uh caller, are you still there? Uh, I guess. Okay, well, we'll, we'll we'll let them try call again. Back, hopefully, caller. call back if you can hear us now. I know we're on a two-minute delay, but call back and, and we'll we'll try that again. Okay. Huh. All right. Um, what as as far as this computer, I, I know I've talked to people that are that are really into computers, and and they've they're you know some of them are familiar with the with the IBM computer that's used some engineers, and they've told me you know that you know oh this is a load of you know this is a load of crap. You know, but then again, I've, I've talked to other people who said, you know, that this is definitely a possibility. And I know, you know, what you were saying earlier about about this 5100, um, it was it was um, what makes it so special, I guess. Well, uh, uh, my understanding is, is that when IBM. Uh, built wait, this here's, here's our caller. Can okay, you hold that call for just a second? Caller, you're on the air. Hi, this is Max calling you back. Sorry about that. Oh, oh no that's problem. okay, Max. How's it going, Max? Oh, it's going good. I do apologize. Something's going on with the computer there. That's oh, cool. no problem. What's your What's your question, Max? Well, I've got actually a couple questions. Okay. Now, it's like it's like when John was going back and forth through time. I'm just wondering if there's any psychological effects, kind of like um, one could equate to drug addiction, for going back and forth through this uh, timescape, as it were. And my second one would be. Based on the environment, I can't remember. Did he mention anything about the environmental changes, the melting of all the glaciers and everything like that? And lots uh, yes to both. Let me see if I can answer the first one. Okay. John described in detail what it was like physically to travel in time. You know, he talked about what you had to have, what it was like, what you did. And he did make mention of the fact that psychologically, um, it was tough to get used to the idea that you could experience things over and over again and not be able to affect them. You know, and I think it kind of came out in some of his posts that we started to wonder whether or not he had done this before and he was getting annoyed with us because nothing ever changed. So I could imagine that, you know, if you went back in time and met multiple versions of your mother or father, that they all wouldn't be exactly the way you remembered them, and that could probably get to you after a while. Um, also, I would say, I don't think John enjoyed what he did. At least he never said anything that made made me feel like he enjoyed his work, that there were advantages to time travel or whatever. So, I, you know, it didn't seem like something that was overly pleasant. As far as the environment goes, he made a comment that the Earth was actually a little bit cooler than it is now. But a lot of people have attributed that to the fact that if there was some sort of a nuclear conflict, that that would account for that. But then I think it was maybe like five, maybe a few weeks ago, 
Um, I think I saw a thing come through my internet where scientists are now saying that that's exactly what they expect the Earth to do, is to cool off considerably in the next few years. Did that get it for you, Max? Oh, actually, my other question is, like you're mentioning this person, Pamela, is this, like, are these the posts that he posted on the Anomalies Forum? No, I, John never posted on the Anomalies Forum. They were actually one of the first websites that co collected all of the posts in mass. What happened was, John posted on another site, uh, it was called the Time Travel Institute, and they're still up and running, by the way, and they've got his posts there also. And at the same time, he went over to Art Bell's site and started posting there before Art took his site down. So he was on both of those sites at the same time. And when Art shut his site down, the anomalies copied everything before the site went away and put it on their site. Uh -huh. So that's where everyone started gravitating toward after Art's site shut down. Okay. I was just trying to figure out the sequence of events on all of this because it just, after all these changes took place, it got hard to keep track of who was who. <laughs> Yeah, and that's actually one of the reasons why I did what I did with my site, trying to put all the, the uh, posts together. But if you poke around, you, will, you know, there's, uh, there's another guy named Darby, and, he's a, and he is a, a staunch critic of, of Teeter, and he's been after him for five or six years now. Well, that's and, you know, my own interpretation of that is he and John actually had some conflict while John was here. And I think John sort of made him look foolish a couple of times. So this guy has been after whoever's behind this forever. <laughs> and then oh. Pamela was one of the original posters. Um, and there are a couple others out there, too, that apparently had some contact with him. Okay. Well, like, these are names that I actually do know because I used to go and actually post on the Anomalies Forum under another name way back when until they decided to ban me. But, hey, that's another story. Okay. So <laughs> you're aware of what was, what's been going on there for a while, too, then. They, if you want to go and see a zillion posts about every aspect of this, then go to the Anomalies site. But I think the moderator's attitude toward the story now, they're sort of getting tired of it. So they've sort of killed off the story. But if you want to go back and look at the history of it, that's a good place to go. Yeah, I know the moderators there. They're, well, that's another story, too. Uh, okay. <laughs> All right, well, thank you for calling in, Max. Thanks, Max. appreciate it. Okay, well, thank you very much. You're welcome. Yeah, bye-bye. All, All right, right we're going to have to take a short break, and we'll be... Um, We'll be right back. How with, short a break is this guy? How short a break? I always tell this. I do this for, for Robin Valley Radio because they always want to know. Um, but, uh, you know, I'm, uh, it's going to be about five minutes, and um, we'll be back um, after this. Okay. Hang tight. S -s Sacrificing millions of dead brain cells so you don't have to. This is Omnisound. So I had a question in the chat room that I'm going to bring back now. Let me, I'm going to have to scroll through um, here because I'm going to have to go back. Everybody's talking here. And it was from Scott. Not me, but another Scott. Um, and it was asking about... Crap, now I can't find it. Um, so, Scott, if you can go ahead and send that question back to me again, I'll, I'll go ahead and uh, I'll go ahead and ask it. Okay. But... Um, Anyway, we were talking about, what was the last thing we were talking about before, uh, oh, here we go. I don't understand his predictions. If Titer, or I'm sorry, Teeter was basing his predictions on his knowledge of his past, then would it be very different from our past since Y2K didn't happen? Okay. Um, actually, that has bewildered me for the last couple of months myself, and I got a couple of emails that started to make sense for me, but I haven't quite sorted it out. Basically, here's the conclusion I've come to. Um... Let's say you went back in time now to, like, 1970. Wait, we, uh, we've got another call. caller. Okay. <laughs> Just a second. <laughs> caller, oh, you're, you're on the air. Hey, guys. How are you guys doing tonight? Good. Oh, excellent. That's good. I have a question. Um, you mentioned earlier that we, in 2036, we'd be friends with the Russians, and we kind of guessed that the Chinese are not quite our friends. Does NAFTA play a big part in our downfall? I'm sorry, NAFTA? Or NASA? NAFTA. NAFTA. Um, John never mentioned that specifically, but I think my interpretation of a lot of people's is that, yes, you are correct. Russia, friend, China, no friend. But no, he did not say anything specific <laughs> about NAFTA. I always wondered about NAFTA because to have fair trade between equals is one thing, but some of our trading partners aren't quite equal. I know China likes to drop their currency, so they, their stuff's always much cheaper. Hmm. No, so I wonder what true. kind of impact that'll have over the years. 
coming up since we're really welded to their economy now, and so are they. Yeah. And also okay. another question. No, go ahead, like technology seems to stay with us after the big uh, nuclear war there, which is good because I like technology. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, that's another point people have brought up is that if the world develops the way he says, and we have this huge war and everything is terrible, how do they find the means to make all these fantastic discoveries? And, you know, if you look back at our own history, you know, say after World War II was when we discovered the jet engine and the computer and all these other nifty things. So, you know, maybe it's not completely impossible, but it is a little bizarre that, you know, on the one hand you're worried about clean food and water, but you have the, the time on your hands to make a time machine. Hmm. That's, a, well, that's a good point. I, you know, that in a way that right now how things are discovered is they're really – in a lab somewhere and some corporate boss saying, we need some new toy to sell tomorrow to make more money. So there's not a lot of innovation. There's a lot of repackaging and making things smaller right now. But there's no, I mean, anybody seen the, you know, nobody's invented the light bulb again, for example. They just, well, we made it better. We made yeah, the iPod know, what, smaller now. Since you were talking, one of the other things John said that I remember now was that when you, you know, you look at the details of how the time machine works, it's a lot less um, major discoveries and more cleverness on how they were able to make stuff work, which told me that maybe some of the things are, are not out of our grasp, but that, you know, you know, finding ways to make the computer smaller, finding ways to keep your black hole from melting through the casing on the machine, you know, those were the big engineering problems. Oh, I'm at oh yeah. Uh, did, I, did I get everything for you? Yeah, thank you very much. Oh, thank All you. Right. Have a good evening. Thanks, okay, you too. Soon. All right. Great. I want to go back to this question. I'm sorry. Yeah. I know you started to answer it. Um, I'll repeat it if you need me to. Oh, sure. I think I, I yeah, I remember what I was going to say. Okay, go ahead. Um, okay, the the gist of why John was right about some things and not others, and this was kind of the email that I got, which, which started to clear it up, at least for me. Let's say you go back to the year 1970 with the knowledge that you have right now. Okay. And you start telling people that this company called Microsoft is going to invent an operating system, and if you buy the stock in it, you're going to get really rich. And you also say that John Lennon is going to be assassinated, and you give the date and the time, and you just leave it at that. So as time goes on, maybe John Lennon believes you, and he decides not to walk out into the park that day. Huh. So in effect, you've changed history, and John Lennon was not killed. So now, does that mean that you're not a time traveler because that didn't happen? Or does it mean that you affected that time and you changed it? But at the same time, it would be unlikely that you could alter the path of Microsoft all by yourself. So it would probably occur that they would develop Windows, they would go on to make zillions of dollars, and you were right about that. So if you look at the things that John is right about, like the Z Machine, CERN, Mad Cow, these are all things that were put into motion years and years ago that would be very difficult for one person claiming to be a time traveler to change. But stuff like the Olympics, you know, that was a big event. Apparently it was linked to this war that didn't happen for us in Y2K. So already John stated that this time was different from his. He was just giving us his memories from the time that he lived in. Okay, I've got another question in the chat room uh, asking if John ever mentions the status of the world's oil reserves. World oil reserve. Oh, yeah. um, no, not specifically, but he does He does talk about the Middle East, so I'm guessing that if there's a conflict, it's probably going to be over oil in the Middle East. You know, again, he, you know, this is back in 2000, 2001, he said that there would not be any weapons of mass destruction in Iraq and that we would go to war with them. So I have to assume he knew something about what was coming our way. Well, here's 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 a good here's a good question here. I think um, now, if you're a time traveler, and you said what, what this thing could go back what 60 years? Right. According to John, his machine started really deviating after about 60 years. All right. Now, when was the first one invented? Then, um, what, the what first year? time machine? Yeah. Uh, according to John, uh, 2034. Oh, okay. Never yeah, mind. You're, you're gonna make my, a I was gonna, I was totally going to go with the Hitler the Hitler yeah. idea. Yeah, <clears throat> yeah, I was totally going to go there. 
Okay, well that that answers that because uh, I was going to say see. what what would, could you would do? You, with yeah, a would you go year? back and yeah, and Castro, actually? Castro, I guess. Oh yeah, would you? Have well, well, you know, to uh, prevent JFK from getting killed. Let yeah. me let me throw you one that John actually said. Now that you mention that. Okay. Um, John took a lot of heat about the fact that he didn't say more about what the future would be like so that we could change things for the better. And one of the examples that he gave, he said, what if you had a time machine and you went back to World War II at Pearl Harbor and you were standing there before the Japanese attacked and you started warning people that the Japanese were coming. And because they took you seriously, they were able to thwart the attack and that would keep the United States out of World War II. But because of that action, you now gave Hitler enough time to develop the atomic bomb, and he went on to devastate Europe and attack the United States and destroy it. So it's very difficult to decide what to do just because you think the outcome is going to be better, Mm, which is why meddling in time apparently was not something that they thought about a lot. Yeah, that makes perfect sense, too. I mean, when you're talking about multiple realities... um, affecting any aspect of the time that you live in could uh, there's no telling what your outcome would be um it causes dramatic change it could i mean i remember an asimov novel and i'm kind of deviating here but it was you know asimov was real real good and real cool about these sort of things but it was involving time travel okay I we, got hold on to that. we got another call hold that thought trent caller you're on the air with us what's your name where are you calling from yep i'm john from messina new york oh hi hey, john. john what's hi, question how are you good good um i've Followed John Teeter the last few weeks before he uh, um, before uh, ever in the last few weeks. Excuse me, I'm kind of mumbling here. Uh, but I, I think uh, I don't want to be sound, sound cruel or anything, but I don't think John Teeter is real. Uh, I don't want to sound bad, but uh, I think time travel is impossible. You have to go, you know, through the theory of Einstein and everything. It, you know, um, does he, does he have any opinions on that? Or Oh, sure. You know, again, I'm, you know, no expert in any of these fields, but it's my, you know, my understanding that if you start to research even what Einstein said, even Einstein said time travel is possible. And when you start to look at some of these scientists like Michio Kaku and some of these others, and even Hawking now, they're coming out and saying, yeah, you know, we have to admit time travel is a possibility now, especially with some of these new theories, you know, string theory and some of these other things that the concept of multiple realities and the idea of time travel are very real, that right now we just don't have the energy to do it. Mm -hmm. So it might be in the near future, maybe, or it's being worked on now, if if it's possible. True, but you know, again, this goes back to another thing John said. How do you go back to the Wright brothers and try to explain to them how a jet engine works? You know, these are guys that are about to discover flight, and in less than 30 years we're going to have jet planes flying around. So, you know, it could be, you know, as close as that, that, you know, these guys are on the verge of doing it. They just don't realize it yet. Hmm. Just some of the things I read are kind of kind of creepy, you know, and there's some things, you know, why, how come, um, was there any signs of the uh, 9-11 attacks, something like that? Because I didn't see anything about that. Yeah, again, that's, you know, a lot of people believe that the facts that he sent to Art, if in fact that was him, the building that doesn't exist anymore in New York was the World Trade Center. Mm-hmm. Wow. Well, he did, he did mention a building. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Okay, I guess I missed that. Huh. I'm my little research here. Oh, no. uh, that's, but that's uh, I, just, I just, you know, I just feel it, you know, it's not possible yet. I don't want to argue. <laughs> no, we're not arguing. I mean, everybody, uh, you know, like, like Oliver says, he doesn't even know if it's real himself, right? Yeah. I mean, uh, it's just something that we, we don't know. Well, you know, I just, you know, again, going back to the caller, I'm not sure I want to know this is real. But at the same time, if I find out it's a hoax, I'm going to be disappointed that way, too. Yeah. Yes. Yep. Did that uh, answer your question? Yeah, yep. Yeah. Let's maybe in the future find out, uh, see what kind of answers come about. Uh, thank yeah. you for your time, sir. Oh. Thank you, John. Thanks, John. Thanks, John. All right. Okay. Wow. Uh, that was, that was, that was a good question. Yeah, it was. I mean, it's always good to have a, a certain amount of healthy skepticism. We got about, um, we got about, oh, I'm sorry, I was looking at the wrong <laughs> thing. <laughs> these things just keep bothering me. Yeah, all these, all these things I have to do, all these windows. You know, the, the internet's great, and computers are great things. 
And I, I do wish I had known about Microsoft in 19, well, not in 1970. Obviously, I wasn't alive then. But, you know, um, I wish my folks had learned about Microsoft right. in 1970. I think we all do. Um, what, we've got about time? five more minutes. Oh, really? So well, we're gonna, I don't yeah. know if I'm going to really so, go with that Asimov thing. Oh, go, go ahead with the Asimov oh, was, thing. Okay, and, real quickly, basically in the book, um, <clears throat> it was a series of people that did, yes, discover time travel. And it goes back to my original question way back in the beginning of the, the show. These guys apparently did very small, subtle things quietly without letting anybody know that they're in that time to basically manipulate the reality, not economically or politically, but but for some kind of higher purpose. Like, they'll do things like, okay, I'm going to move this videotape down here to the second shelf where this guy's not going to find it. Things like that. They're so small and insignificant at the time, and yet it's like a butterfly effect, basically. That's what Asimov was getting at, you know? Well, um, you know, but... According to John, yes, you can do that, but in order to take advantage of it, you have to stay there. As right. soon as you leave, everything you've done is moot. Yeah, yeah, I see what you're saying. Yeah, I, uh, I just wanted to bring that point up. Anyway. Are there are there any last um, any final thoughts or any any final comments or anything like that you want to make about all this? You know, I. I, I find this very entertaining, and again, I, it's kind of like finding out Bigfoot doesn't exist, or, <laughs> you know, the Loch Ness, Ness monster isn't real. There's a part of me that's terrified, and then there's a part of me that wants to know that it's not real. Yeah. And I think that's what makes this so entertaining. That's true. That's yeah. true. It's very true. I mean, one way or another, you know. and uh... Yeah, one way or the other, it's not good news. It's either fake and we're all wasting our time, or it's real and we're all screwed. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> that's true. Um the uh, the website Oliver Williams website is www.johnteeter.com. That's T I T O R. Check that out for you, those of you listening tonight for the first time that don't know anything about this. I'm, I'm sure there's not that many of you. I mean, where have you been under a rock? But <laughs> no, I'm kidding. <laughs> but uh, you know, if, if check that website out, and if they have any questions, I'm assuming they can email the website and you can get back to them. Oh, absolutely. I try to answer as much as I can, but we get flooded with hundreds and hundreds of emails. So oh, I'm sure. I'm but, sure you know, I'll tell you what I do appreciate. If anybody's got a news story or anything that pertains to this, I'm happy to get that stuff because I post it as soon as I can. Okay, that's Excellent. great. Well, Oliver, we thank you so much for your time, and we, we appreciate you coming out and, and talking with yeah. us tonight. Thanks a no lot, No problem. Oliver. It, was, it was great, guys. Thanks. All right, thank appreciate you. Appreciate it. All right. Uh, wow. How about a little Elvis? That was uh, a little Elvis. How about what? A little Elvis. A little Elvis. A little Elvis. There we go. Uh. Press the button a little hard. There we go. It works. Time. Okay. Mysterious. Time travel. The unexplained. Yeah. The unexplained. That's what we do best, baby. Yep. All right. All of our uh, listeners out there, thanks for listening. Um, yeah. Thanks to you guys in the in the chat room too, man. There's yeah. a lot of crazy stuff going on. Even even making fun of my accent here in North Carolina. North saying, Carolina. Oh, Would you go talk like this? The whole, I can't say oh, all right. Oh. Yeah. It, <laughs> oh, it George W. Be. can though, can he? Uh, hmm. <laughs> well, let's uh, talk about some guests in the in the upcoming that's, weeks. That's where let's I was going. That. You know who I got? Who do you have? I got David Frant. No. I did. David Frant, the, the vampire hunter. element in that high, high gate vampire. Sean Manchester was the other one. That was actually our very first show, actually. What's that? Sean Manchester? Yeah. I mean, he don't he don't give interviews. Yeah, he anymore. should get. Um, but l- let me let me uh, let me bring that up real quick and I'll yeah. tell you because I don't know who's on for oh I know who's on yeah. for next week. It's your guy. My you, guy. Yeah you need to email him actually with his questions. I sure do. Yeah. Um we're we're taking a, a different turn into the world, mysterious world of the ancients, which is something that I'm always keen in talking about. Uh, this guy apparently is a um, a uh, professor in Egypt. That's right. We're going to be talking to a guy from Egypt. That alone is just mind blowing, honestly. From what? Oh, it's okay. Right, go ahead. Anyway, um, it's just mind blowing. We'll be talking to this guy. Uh, his name is uh, Sama Al Sadawi. Yeah, and um, he has a fairly radical, divergent view on the nature of Egyptology, how the pyramids were built, how it all connected way back in the day. And that's always something I've been keen on. And uh, he knows who he claims he knows who built the uh, pyramids at, at, at um, the Gaza, the Gaza, 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 Gaza. Sorry, Gaza. And um, pretty wild stuff. That's true. I mean, it's it's something 
I've been looking forward to it. Just the nature of calling somebody from Egypt, actually. Yeah. Well, we've uh, got Rosemary Ellen Gott. soon with uh, John Zappas we'll talk about exorcisms and things sure. like that uh, good on the list Scott All right. continuing Ethan Deaton Meyer film director of Sinjin Smith is going to be with us on uh, April 24th a guy that we um, uh, got connected with the Eileen Deets see there goes the music well it, it is again <laughs> I know um, May yeah. 1st we've got Tom and Lisa Butler from the American Association of Electronic Voice Phenomena EVP yeah and they helped out in White Noise that's right so that should be fun Nigel Suckling on May 8th. This guy has an internet site up. I really don't know much about him, but it looked interesting, so... Well, he's got three books there about things that we like to talk about. That's right. Vampires, werewolves, and witches. That's right. Facts, figures, and fun. So, I don't know. Or... Who knows? Um, Mike, May 15th, Michael Zarian is going to talk about his book, um, Atlantis Alien Visitation Genetic Manipulation. Hmm. Um, then, special three-hour show. Special three-hour show. May 22nd, we have our friend... Joshua P. Warren. That's right. He's going to be there with, with an hour for us. That's all he's going to be able to give us. But after that, we go to Adam Go Rightly, um, who, who describes himself as a crackpot historian. Wow. The week after that, that's where my guy David Ferran comes in. David Ferran. Oh, there he is right there. He's, his picture's right up on the all website. Right, it's, it's on the site, guys. You can check it out. And um, Six Charm Divine Dove, some psychics are going to be with us the following week. And then our pre-recorded interview with David Icke on June 12th. That's all we've got right now in the works. Well, we've got other things that we'll yeah, talk we about later. we always got stuff in the works for you, general listeners. Lloyd Auerbach's actually coming to the show in July. No kidding. No kidding. Right. So uh, until next time, guys, it looks like our time's out. But uh, check out the website. Check out the archives. And uh, we hope you, um, you've had a good time tonight because right. I know we have. Thanks a lot. All right, this is uh, Trent Lackey. Uh, this is Jay Scott. We're signing off for World of the Unexplained. Take care. Bye.